In section 4.1, we look at the basic graphs of the six trigonometric functions. First, let's take a look at this table we have here. For the values of x, we are plugging in all of these angles between 0 and 2 pi. And for the y value, we are looking at the sine of those angles. So when x is 0, we know the sine of 0 is 0. When x is pi over 4, sine of pi over 4 is 1 over radical 2, which is approximately 0.7, etc. So I won't go through all these values here, but when you take those x values and y values and put them together, you get points, and you can graph those points. So the way we graph the sine function is we lay out on the x-axis the angles from 0 to 2 pi. So you can see them all here. And then on the y-axis, we're graphing the value of the sine of those angles, and that's all of these values here. So for example, when x is 0, the angle 0, sine is also 0. When x is pi over 4, sine is approximately 0.7. At pi over 2, sine is 1. At 3 pi over 4, sine is again 0.7, etc. And so what you should see is that the graph goes up, comes down, goes all the way down to negative 1 when x is 3 pi over 2, and then goes back up to 0 again because the sine of 2 pi is 0. This other graph here just shows some of the other angles that are not listed in this table, such as pi over 6, pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, etc. And you can see you get the same graph here. So when you graph the sine function, you get this sort of wave function. Now, if you're not quite sure exactly how we got this graph, let's look at it another way. So if you go back to the unit circle, which is what we have here, and you think about an angle T in standard position, remember that on the unit circle, the angle T in radians is the distance from the point one zero to this point here along the circle. So this is our angle T, that distance. Sine is the y-coordinate of that point. So you can see that when the angle is down here, the y-coordinate is 0. And as you move along the circle here, you can see that when the angle is pi over 2, the y-coordinate of this point is 1. You can see that illustration down here. So when I have a particular angle T, let's say, T is this angle right here, so it's that distance. And the Y value there is that height. And you can see that you've matched that up right there. And this distance, if you lay that out on the X axis, is this distance here. Okay. And as we move along, so if I go to this next angle here, that's my angle T. If I lay that angle out along the x-axis, I get this length. And then the height you can see there. So the sine function is what we call periodic. As it goes around the circle, the y values of these coordinates start at 0, increase to 1, go back down to 0, then the y-coordinates go all the way to negative 1, and then they go back to 0 again. And as you continue to go around this unit circle, those values will repeat themselves over and over again. So the function y equals sine of x, if you graph it beyond 0 to 2 pi, you will see that after you go through this cycle one time, that cycle repeats over and over again, and it also repeats in the other direction. So you get sort of this infinite wave function. Let's take a look at an example. 
So in our first example, we want to use the graph of y equals sine of x, given below here, to find all values of x between 0 and 2 pi, for which sine is equal to 1 half. So we are looking at the function y equals sine of x, and we want sine of x to equal 1 half. So what this means is we need to identify all the points on this graph where y is equal to 1 half. Well, if you look at the y-axis, 1 half is right here. So if I draw a horizontal line, you can see that this horizontal line will intersect this curve twice. It intersects here and also here at that particular height. So the values of x that produce a sine of 1 half are these two values of x here. And so that is pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. Now please understand that these are just the values between 0 and 2 pi. If we were to extend this graph beyond 2 pi, there would be many, many other values of x that would also have a sine value equal to 1 half. Just remember this curve here, right? This is an extension of the sine graph. If I look at the y value of 1 half here, notice that when I draw a horizontal line at that particular y value, if I extend that horizontal line in both directions, you can see that there are many, many times that that horizontal line intersects the curve y equals sine of x. In this picture, you can see six such instances and so this would be your pi over 6 and your 5 pi over 6, but then you would have other values here. And I'll list them just, just to be complete here. This one would be 13 pi over 6, and this one would be 17 pi over 6. And in the other direction, we have this value here, which is negative 7 pi over 6, and then this one here, which is negative 11 pi over 6. So you can imagine that if we were looking at sine of x is equal to 1 half, and we wanted to know what all the values of x's were, you would have infinitely many solutions. And we'll talk more about how to describe those kinds of solutions later. Now let's define what we mean by the period of a function. So the definition here says the length of the smallest segment on the x-axis that it takes for a graph to go through one complete cycle is called the period of that graph, or the equation that it came from. In symbols, if p is the smallest positive number for which f of x plus p is equal to f of x, and if this is true for all values of x, then we say that the period of f of x is p. So in the case of y equals sine of x, the period is 2 pi, since 2 pi is the smallest positive number p, for which sine of x plus p is equal to sine of x for all x. So again, if you just look at the sine graph, which starts here and goes through one complete cycle to here, that happens between 0 and 2 pi, and the length of that interval is 2 pi units. After that, that same graph repeats over and over again, infinitely many times. And every time it repeats, the length of the interval that it takes to repeat is 2 pi additional units. So that is why we say the period is 2 pi. Now let's talk about the amplitude of a function. So if the greatest value of y is capital M, and if the least value of y is lowercase m, then the amplitude of a graph is defined to be a equals 1 half times the absolute value of capital M minus little m. So in the case of y equals sine of x, the amplitude is 1, because if you look at your sine graph up here, you can see that the maximum value that the sine graph touches is positive 1, 
and the minimum value, the lowest value that it touches, is negative 1. So in the case of sine, we have capital N is 1, and little m is negative 1. And the amplitude is 1 half times the absolute value of big M minus little m. And this is 1 half times the absolute value of 2, which is 1 half times 2, which is 1. And you can see that math that they did here. So the amplitude of the sine graph is 1. Now, not all graphs have an amplitude. To have an amplitude, you have to have a highest point and a lowest point. And some graphs go up forever or down forever, in which case they would not have an amplitude. In our next example, we want to sketch the graph for y equals cosine of x. Now, this is very similar to graphing the sine function, except that we know that when x is 0, the cosine of 0 is 1. And then you can go through the values here. I won't explain all these, but these simply come from the unit circle. So when x is 0, you get your highest point. And then from there, when x is pi over 4, you get 1 over radical 2. When x is pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, etc. So I want you to notice that the shape of this graph is exactly the same as the shape of the sine graph. It just starts at the high point instead of starting at the origin. So just for reference here, let's remember what the sine graph looks like. So here it is, just for reference. So again, the sine graph starts at the origin, goes to its highest point, goes back down, goes to its lowest point, and comes back to the middle. Whereas cosine starts at the high point, goes to the middle, goes down to its lowest point, back to the middle, and back up to its highest point. So again, these two graphs are very similar to each other. They both have the same amplitude and period, but they just start at a different spot in the curve. And for a visual uh, representation of how we can get the cosine graph, once again, if you take an angle here, and you call that angle T, and you look at the measure of that angle T in radians, that's the length of this arc. If you lay that arc out on the x-axis, remember cosine is the x value associated with this particular point. So the length of that x value here is this, and that's how we're getting the cosine of those numbers. So as you move around the unit circle, you can see that at this point, the x value is 1. And then as you move up to pi over 2, the x value here is 0. And then the x value goes to negative 1. And then the x value goes back to 0 again. And then x goes back to 1 again. So that's what's happening. You're just going through your angle on the x-axis here. And your y value is representing the value of cosine of that angle. So it starts at 1, goes down to 0, down to negative 1, back up to 0, and finally back up to 1 again. So a quick example regarding cosine. We want to find all values of x for which cosine of x is equal to negative 1. So here's our cosine graph, just for reference. We want to look at where cosine is negative 1. Well, here's negative 1. If I draw a horizontal line there, you can see that at least between 0 and 2 pi, there's only one spot where cosine is equal to negative 1. However, if we remember that the cosine graph, like the sine graph, repeats itself over and over again in both directions, you can see that if you draw a horizontal line at negative 1, like we have here, you can see that it touches the curve at many points, all of these points here. Now, how do you describe those points? Well, we can see we have x equals negative 3 pi, negative pi, positive pi, and positive 3 pi. And if you were to guess, what would the next one be as we move outward here? Well, if you guessed 5 pi, you guessed correctly. And the one after that would be 7 pi, and then 9 pi. So what you should notice with these values is that these are all odd multiples of pi, both positive and negative. 
So now how do we describe all of those solutions? Well, one way you can do it is you can simply write it like this, where you have these dots that indicate that this pattern continues in both directions. But another way to do it is you can learn how to describe odd numbers. So let's talk about that real quick. Let's suppose that n is equal to an integer. Okay, now an integer is a number like negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. These are integers. If n is any one of these numbers, think about what 2n would be. 2n would be taking all of these numbers and multiplying them by 2. And so if we did that, we would get, just think about multiplying all these numbers here by 2, we would get negative 6, negative 4, negative 2, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. What you should notice about this is 2n is always an even integer. So this is how you can describe an even integer. You just call it 2n. But we want to describe an odd integer. Well, the way you get an odd number if you know you have an even number is you just add 1 to that number. So if I look at the expression 2n plus 1, this is always going to be an odd integer because all I'm doing is I'm taking every single number in this set of numbers and I'm adding 1 to it. So let's think about what that would be. What do you get when you add 1 to negative 6? Well, you get negative 5. If you add 1 to negative 4, you get negative 3. If you add 1 to negative 2, you get negative 1. If you add 1 to 0, you get positive 1. Add 1 to 2, you get 3, 5, 7, 9, etc. So the way we mathematically describe an odd integer is 2n plus 1. We want to get used to doing that, okay? So now let's come back to these answers. How could I describe all of the places where cosine of x is equal to negative 1? Well, we already said that x has to be one of these numbers. And we already noticed that these are basically just the odd multiples of pi. So an easy way to describe this would just be to say it has to be 2n plus 1 times pi. Because 2n plus 1 is your odd number and you're multiplying that pi. So this is the mathematical way of describing odd multiples of pi. And any time we do this, it is understood that n is always just a regular integer. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in the coming chapters as well. Now we're going to look at the graph of tangent. And this is where things get a little bit more interesting. So if I just plug in some values in for x, and I take y equals the tangent of x, if x is 0, the tangent of 0 is 0. If x is pi over 4, the tangent of pi over 4 is 1. Tangent of pi over 3 is 1.7. And tangent of pi over 2 is undefined. Now let's talk about why is tangent of pi over 2 undefined. So let's remember that tangent of pi over 2 is the same as sine of pi over 2 divided by cosine of pi over 2. And sine of pi over 2 is 1, and cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And 1 divided by 0 is undefined. So when you look at the graph over here, which you can already kind of see, at pi over 2, you'll notice that we have this vertical line drawn right here. And that line is called a vertical asymptote. And what that means is that the tangent function does not have a value at that particular value of x. Okay, and this is because tangent is undefined at pi over 2. Well, tangent is also undefined at 3 pi over 2. And it's undefined at 5 pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. In fact, tangent is undefined at all of the odd multiples of pi over 2. So tangent 
is undefined if x is equal to an odd multiple of pi over 2. This is because cosine of an odd multiple of pi over 2 is always 0. Okay, So tangent is always undefined there. So that's why when you look at the graph of tangent, you have all of these vertical asymptotes. Now, why does tangent have the shape that it has? Well, it's because as the value of your angle gets closer to pi over 2, the value of tangent begins to increase. So tangent of 0 is 0. Tangent of pi over 2 is 1. Tangent of pi over 3 is 1.7. And if you look at more values of x getting closer and closer to pi over 2, you'll notice that the value of tangent begins to increase. And that is why you have this particular shape. And then in the negative direction, if you plug in negative values of x, you'll notice that you get larger and larger negative numbers. And so that is why the tangent has this very distinct shape. Now, once you graph tangent between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, that graph repeats itself over and over again. So the period of the tangent function is pi, right, instead of 2 pi. So it's a little bit different than sine and cosine. Okay? So the main thing is when you're trying to think about how you're going to remember all this stuff is you want to remember what the graph of the first cycle looks like. So if you know the graph between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 for tangent, you can just repeat that graph, right? So just this graph here gets repeated over and over again, and that's how you can learn to graph the tangent function. But you do have to memorize this first little section of the graph. So the next example says, find the values of x between negative pi over 2 and positive 3 pi over 2 that satisfy the equation tangent of x is equal to negative 1. So what we're doing is we're looking at that tangent graph, which looks like this, and we're only looking at it between negative pi over 2, which is this asymptote, and 3 pi over 2, which is this asymptote. So you can see here that in between those two values, we have two cycles of tangent. And we want to know when tangent is equal to negative 1. So we draw a horizontal line at y equals negative 1. And you can see that there are two spots where it hits the tangent function there. And the first one is at negative pi over 4, and the second one is at 3 pi over 4. So the answer here, what are the values of x for which tangent of x is equal to negative 1, is x equals negative pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. Next, I'm going to talk about how to sketch the graph of cosecant. And the way you want to think about cosecant is remember that if you're looking at cosecant, cosecant is 1 over sine, right? So we're going to have to use the sine function to help us graph the cosecant function. So if you look at the graph that is listed here, you'll see that this graph is the sine function. So this is y equals sine of x, and we can continue it in both directions. And the reason we do this is because anywhere sine is 0, cosecant will be undefined, right? So if sine of x is equal to 0, then cosecant of x is going to be undefined. And that's just because if, if sine is 0, cosecant is 1 divided by 0, right? So what that means is that everywhere sine is 0, which is at all these points right here, you are going to have an asymptote, a vertical asymptote. Okay, so that's why these asymptotes here exist. All right? Now, how do you get the graph of the cosecant function? Well, remember, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So, for example, when sine is one-half, 
cosecant is going to be 2. When sine is 1 third, cosecant is going to be 3. So the smaller that the value of sine gets, the larger the value of cosecant gets. So the graph of cosecant will touch the sine function right at the top of the hump there, but then it is going to be this shape. And it's kind of like a U shape, right? But it's not exactly like a U because that U has to always be in between these two vertical lines. The opposite happens when you look at the other side of the graph. So here, sine is negative 1. Cosecant will also be negative 1. And then you're going to have a U-shape going in the other direction. And that's because when you take reciprocals of small negative numbers, you get large negative numbers. And so if you know what the graph of sine looks like, you can sketch that graph. You can draw asymptotes everywhere that the sine graph crosses the x-axis. And then you can just sketch these little U-shaped graphs. And this is the easiest way to graph cosecant. Now, the last two graphs that we haven't talked about are y equals cotangent of x and y equals secant of x. I'll talk about secant first. To graph secant, you do it the exact same way you graph cosecant, except that you need to remember that if you're graphing secant, secant is 1 over cosine. So what you have to do is you have to sketch the cosine graph, which is what you see here. And then everywhere cosine crosses the x-axis, you will have an asymptote at that value, just like you did for cosecant. And then after you sketch all your asymptotes, the, your graph is just going to be these U-shaped graphs coming off of, in this case, the cosine graph. So the process for graphing secant is exactly the same as the process for graphing cosecant. And then cotangent, you'll notice that cotangent looks a lot like tangent. Tangent had a shape where it was going up. Cotangent has the same shape, but it's coming down. And cotangent also has different asymptotes. Now, how do you know the asymptotes for cotangent? Well, remember that cotangent is defined to be cosine over sine, right? So if sine is equal to zero, cotangent is going to be undefined. So remember what your sine graph looks like. Your sine graph, right, starts here, goes up like this, comes down like this, and goes back up like this. So anywhere sine is equal to zero, you're going to have an asymptote for cotangent, okay? So that's a good way to remember where the asymptotes are for cotangent. And you can do the same thing for tangent as well, all right? Now, the, the short thing here is to understand the basic graphs, there is a certain amount of memorization that you must do, right? So you're not always going to want to think about why the graphs look the way they do. You want to go ahead and memorize these things. So you need to memorize the six basic graphs for your trig functions.